What I find funny is that the greatest scientist, you know, since Newton, was himself so insecure as a scientist. I mean, it's almost funny to me that you think that anybody uh, could be guilty of worrying about what others think, but not Einstein. Well, I, and I'm Einstein not... was so scared of being tagged as a religious guy because of his, his equations point to the idea that the universe expanded from nothing, sounds too much like Genesis, so he nervously, you know, creates this fudge factor. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was in Einstein's case a case of social anxiety. I think it was just the power of a default way of thinking. This was the way people, every, all thinking people, uh, thought about things coming out of the 19th century. And so it was a more of a reflexive, this can't possibly be the answer. It's got to be something that doesn't involve a beginning. But the, part of the interesting story of, of, that I tell in the book is the story of these reversals. Einstein, by 1931, goes and views the evidence for himself at the, the Mount Wilson Observatory with Hubble. Uh, he's already been told about it in advance, so he's prepared. And he gives an interview to the New York Times two weeks later and says, well, you know, I guess I got this wrong. The universe isn't static. It is expanding. And he later said that... that the way he fiddled with his own equations to, t to try to obscure that fact was the great, he said, the greatest blunder of my life. Hoyle, Did he say it in English? Like I, the reason I'm asking is because I've seen it, I've seen it translated, uh, or I've seen it phrased as, it was the greatest stupidity of my life, and others said it's the greatest blunder of my life. And I wonder uh, if he said it in German or in English. I, I don't know. It's a good question, Eric. I don't know. He may uh, have simply said, have, whoopsie daisy. Blunder. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we don't know. But it, but it is funny, though, that it took him uh, 15 to 20 years to come to, to, to this come reckoning and, and to deal with And then the you have a, a very similar story with, with Fred Hoyle, who's a committed scientific materialist. He formulates the steady state cosmology, which is a, a variant on Einstein's idea of the static universe, defends it tenaciously, but he's very explicit in explaining that he formulated this because the alternative was an, a, an overtly theistic view, and he was a scientific naturalist as a, as a matter of his philosophy. And then later he discovers some of the most compelling and interesting and improbable fine-tuning parameters, the ones that are necessary to account for the abundance of carbon in the universe, which is necessary for life. And he later changes his view to a kind of quasi-theistic position and says the, the, the best data we have concerning the fine-tuning uh, are what we'd expect if uh, there was a super intellect that monkeyed with physics and chemistry. So he comes around. I actually had a conversation with him when I was still a grad student in Cambridge, and he'd come to talk about the, the origin of life problem. And afterwards, I chatted with him a bit and told him what, that I was working on this idea that DNA seemed to point to design, and he said, you know, come, come walk with me. And we had this little walk down to the, the, the college uh, common room, and he said, yeah, if, if we could invoke intelligence, it would make explaining a lot of things a lot easier. I, when, you, when, you, when, yeah. you, when you said that he said, you know, come walk with me, I thought, you know, you'd end up dead or something <laughs> like that, because he's like, we can't have people like you around here. Yeah. Um, you, I mean, the, st the story of Hoyle, maybe you can shed light on this. I don't know if you write about it in the book. I don't remember. But I found it fascinating that Hoyle was a, de he was dedicated to the idea that, uh, you know, the, the right way of thinking is that there is no God and the universe has been here forever. And he clung to that long past when others, w you know, accepted the Big Bang. And we should say he coined the term Big Bang. He was speaking in a... BBC interview in 1949, and speaking derisively... He, he meant it as a pejorative. Yeah, yeah like, oh, yeah, that stupid Big Bang yeah. thing, and it's like, whoop, the, the term kind of... Caught on. Caught on. Yeah. And, um, but I, as, as I read a little bit, I, I got the impression that he was maybe becoming more honest as the years passed. Oh, no question. I mean, he was, he was pretty much an advocate of the design hypothesis as, uh, as it applied to the fine-tuning problem. Which, and he was one of the scientists who, who formulated, or who made those discoveries. So early on he was said that religion is but a desperate attempt to give people comfort, and no wonder people get upset with people like me who tell them it's all an illusion. But later in his life he's, he, he says uh, the best data we have are, are what we'd expect if a super intellect monkeyed with physics and chemistry. It was fine-tuning suggested to him a fine-tuner. If, if you don't mind my asking you, because I, I, I wrote about it in my book, and it's your story, 
You told me the story of um, the conference you were at in 1985 and what happened, because I'm, uh, I, I want folks to, to hear a little bit of your story, how you got involved in everything that you've been doing in the last uh, decades. Can, can you tell a bit about, about, about the story uh, with Hubble and, and your yeah, conference? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was a um, young scientist. I was working as a geophysicist for a local oil company in Dallas. Um, I had always been interested in the, in the big questions, as you were saying before, that were at the intersection between science and philosophy. So as an undergrad, I, used to, I, I did a double major in physics and geology, largely at my father's urging to stick with the hard sciences, but uh, I always snuck over and took at least one philosophy class. Anyway, this conference came to Dallas, and it was called uh, Christianity Challenges the University, an international conference of atheists and theists. It sounded pretty intriguing. They had three panels, one on the origin of the universe, one on the origin of life, and one on the origin and nature of human consciousness. And the panels were stocked with people who were either self-identified theists in their worldview or self-identified scientific naturalists or materialists. And in the very first panel, uh, one of the most prominent speakers at the conference, Alan Sandage, a great cosmologist and astrophysicist. I'm, and I meant... Sandage, not Hubble. Well, yeah, he, yeah. I mean, it's not a, uh, he worked for Hubble. He was yeah, Hubble's no, I know. graduate That's why student. I made so, a mistake, but yeah. So anyway, he went on to extend Hubble's research program, and he'd been a long time well-known as an agnostic Jewish scientist, and at the conference he announced a religious conversion, that he'd actually become a Christian. In 1985, he announces this at the conference. And explains that, that and then proceeded to give a talk on the evidence of, of the new cosmology, what we'd learned from multiple sources, the light coming from the distant galaxies, the cosmic background radiation, the, all the different key evidences for the Big Bang or the idea that the universe had a beginning. And then I, re I remember him, you know, he was not, in, in a way, he was not very happy about having this, th this need to change his worldview thrust upon him. But that's where he, so he was a sort of very grave sort of figure, and he said, here is evidence for, for what can only be described as a super space natural event. There's no way this, meaning the evidence we have at the beginning of the universe, could have been explained or, or, or predicted within the realm of physics as we know it. And of course, that's the same point I was making before. You can't explain the origin of the physical world physically because before there was a physical world, there was no physics to do the explaining. And so he, he then proceeded to explain that he was really moved to a point of, of thinking deeply about religious faith because whereas the evidence was pointing unequivocally in one direction, he didn't want it to be so. And then he began to, th he, said, he explained that he began to think about, well, what is it about me that doesn't want this to be so? I've always prided myself on, his, on my objectivity. It was a very compelling story. In the very next panel, there was a similar intellectual conversion announced by a leading origin of life researcher who worked on this problem of abiogenesis named Dean Kenyon. And Kenyon announced at, in, on the panel, he also surprised people by sitting on the side with the theists and explained, he argued that the, the discovery of the information bearing properties of DNA, everything that, that Crick had anticipated, um, suggests that the, what he called the natural theological question should now be reopened by the philosophers. In other words, we may as scientists be looking at evidence for the existence of God in the inner workings of the cell. And so I'm, you know, 27 years old. I'm kind of blown away at this. It was clear to me that the theists seemed to have the intellectual initiative in the discussion, that the people defending chemical evolutionary theory had nothing to offer except promissory notes that maybe we'll figure it out down the road. So I, I, got, a, I got really seized with this. I was working with uh, doing digital signal processing of seismic data, which was an early form of information technology, and the thought that the discovery of information inside cells was the holy grail of the origin of life problem just absolutely seized me. I got really fascinated with that. I met a, another scientist who was on the panel that day named Charles Thaxton, who had written a, a recent book called Myst The Mystery of Life's Origin. He happened to be living in Dallas. I started having long conversations with him after work. A year later, I was off to grad school and realized, I want to work on this origin of life problem. <laughs>